to talk to you about um, this project that, that Greg gave me. He called me last year about this time, last year, and he said, hey, you know what, we have these eight questions. We have these eight high-level key questions that managers and policy people would really like to have the answer to. And he said, would you be able to do like an independent review of the network of IMWs and respond to these questions? And I said, well, sure. And you know, it really makes you feel good when you've spent over 30 years of your life doing this kind of work. And during those first 30 years, you're doing all these studies and everybody is like throwing rocks at it. It's like everybody is like criticizing your work. And after 30 years, people actually ask you to criticize other people's work. You know you've met the uh, apex of your career. So I jumped all over that. I said, hey, absolutely. And he said, you'll be working with the Science Center, so I'll be working with George and Kim. And uh, we're going to evaluate all these IMWs and all the questions. So um, as part of this, uh, uh, Greg already identified the questions. And Greg did a great job this morning. He, he, you know, he and I coordinated this morning, or last night, and, uh, before the uh, Viagra thing. And uh, he and I were talking about, you know, how to lay the foundation for my talk. And I said, yeah, I would, you know, go over the questions. And he did a great job of that. Almost too good because he answered most of the questions for us. So I'll just reiterate what Greg said on some of these. And uh, uh, here are the eight questions. Pretty simple. The first one, are the IMWs co covering a representative range of habitat improvement strategies and environmental conditions? Are the IMWs asking the most appropriate and relative que and relevant question? Are the IMWs in watersheds with high potential for learning? What are we learning from the IMWs? Are all the IMWs still needed to answer the primary questions in the region? And if so, what purposes and for what period of time? And that's probably the one that you're most nervous about. Are there IMWs that have reached a logical conclusion or for other reasons should be ramped down or ended. That's another one that makes us a little nervous. And then are there additional IMWs that should be brought online? And finally, are there any of the IMWs unlikely to meet their intended objectives within the implied tenure timeline? And if so, what is constraining them? So these are the eight questions that I was asked to respond to with, uh, with George and Cham. And we do, I do have, I have to make this clear, I do have a report out, but it was only my work so far. George and Tim uh, just received it a couple of weeks ago, and they're going to be adding their stuff to it. So what I'm going to talk about today is mostly my thinking uh, with regard to the network of IMW. So how do we do this? I'm sure most of you would just love to have me call you 60 or 70 times to ask you questions about your IMW. And uh, the PNAP group and I, we sat down and we said, you know, they probably won't want that. Um, so let's identify a questionnaire and send out this questionnaire to all the IMW leads and let them respond to it. So we developed that questionnaire. You guys have seen it. It had questions related to the basic information, the context of the IMW, your statistical design, sampling design, measurements and results. Okay. That was wonderful. You guys all responded to it. And in fact, PNAP actually put together a small summary report of it. Um, some of you were quite the overachievers, like Steve and, and George and others just went to town with it and just provided gobs and gobs of information. Others just kept it short and sweet. I'm not going to say who was short and sweet, but uh, they provided enough helpful information that we were able to evaluate their IMW. And so then we relied heavily on these responses. And like I said, we used the draft report uh, prepared by PNAP. And I want you to know, first of all, that this is a high-level review that we did. You know, I could, and I would love to, go through the dark recesses of all your experimental designs and your sampling approaches and things like that, because there is no perfect approach to anything. And I work in the Upper Columbia, and I work on several technical teams, and we've, we've become experts at criticizing projects. So much so that we've actually probably prevented some really good projects from hitting the ground because we can find the tiniest thing to nitpick. That is not what I'm intending to do here. I did not do that here and do not intend to do that. Rather, I just want to do more of a high, high level review of the IMW. Here's a, another picture that you've seen many times. Uh, Greg showed this earlier. This shows the general location of all the IMWs that we evaluated. It is missing one. And that's the pudding. 
uh, IMW, which is down in California. We evaluated that one. We actually added the, um, the Fish Creek one. That was not an original IMW uh, that this group has evaluated in the past, so we added it because it was one of the earlier ones. Um, and it provided a lot of useful information. I want to talk about that. And then I dropped the Methow in the Upper Columbia because the Methow truly is not an IMW. It's a it's a really good reach scale effectiveness monitoring project, but it isn't measuring anything at the Methow scale or at the population watershed scale. It's mostly at a smaller scale. So we basically dropped that from our evaluation. So let's just jump right in here because I have as much time as I want to take. Unlike you people, you had to confine everything. I have a three-hour talk that I'm going to try and condense into like 60 minutes. So here we go. Are the IMWs uh, covering a representative range of habitat improvement strategies and environmental conditions? Well, you can look at this in many different ways. And the first way is um, how many IMWs? are addressing each of the major categories of restoration action. So there are different types of actions. You have in-stream structures as a restoration technique, off-channel floodplain connectivity, fish, fish passage, riparian improvement, flow augmentation, sediment reduction, nutrient enhancement. If you look through the literature, these are the main categories for restoration. And you can see that there's at least one or two IMWs that are addressing all these. Most of them, do the in-stream structures, but every major category is being addressed currently within one or two IMWs. And so that's good. That, that tells us that at least the major categories for restoration are being addressed. Now, not all the subcategories of each of these are being addressed. For example, there's a category under in-stream structures that is called gravel augmentation or gravel addition. And this is where you go and you uh, go to a quarry, you get the right size gravel, you clean it, and then you go dump it in the river. This is done quite a bit uh, down in California. They've done that in some flow controlled uh, rivers down there. As far as I could tell, there are no IMWs that are actually doing that. That is not to say that there are IMWs addressing spawning habitat. They may be using other techniques such as opening up spawning habitat that was previously blocked. Or they may be using structures that sort gravel that create spawning habitat. So just because spawning gravel addition wasn't identified as a technique does not necessarily mean that spawning habitat was not one of the limiting factors of draft. And so looking at the, the number of IMWs that address all the different project categories, I think we're good there. Well, what about the number of uh, IMWs that fall in all the different eco regions within the Pacific Northwest? As far as I can tell, we have at least one IMW in every ecoregion except one, and that's the Okanagan ecoregion. And if you wanted to, you could put one up there in the Okanagan because they're reintroducing Chinook salmon, so that's a possibility, and they also have still had it there. But it's really the only ecoregion that I, I did not find an IMW associated with it. Um, all the others had at least one or more. The coast range had the most. Most of the IMWs occur on the hill, which is useful information. Now, what I'm excited to see is when George and Tim get this, especially Tim, what he does with this, because he'll look at all these IMWs and say, well, how many are covered in this kind of geology type? How many are in this geomorphology? How many are in this channel type, and et cetera? And what we'll find out is that we'll have a lot of those that aren't covered, and so we're going to end up doing IMWs everywhere in the Pacific Northwest. So. Just for the funders, that may be something you, want to, you might want to think about. So, okay, are the IMWs asking the most, most appropriate and relative, uh, relevant questions? All IMWs are asking, the answer is clearly yes, um, they're all asking if the treatments benefit fish at the population scale. We've already seen or heard uh, several of the IMW folks get up here and talk about it, and I loved it when you showed, here's a threat, right? Here's the threat, it's logging. And here's the limiting factor. Logging reduced the amount of pools and cover in terms of woody debris for fish. And here's the life cycle or the life stage of fish that it affects, and this is what we propose to do. That is beautiful, that's exactly what you wanna see in an IMW or in any action effectiveness monitoring thing. So 
so as far as I could tell, yes, you are um, asking the right questions. Um, and the actions range from single treatment in some IMWs to multiple treatment. For example, we saw in some of the coastal ones, there was like a single treatment. They put wood in. You, then we heard about the Middle Fork uh, John Day, and I can't even count how many they put in there. It's N, where N is large. They put a bunch in. Okay, so we have um, multiple actions addressing multiple limiting factors. And then, uh, finally, the specific questions related to causal mechanisms were often lacking. In other words, when we evaluated the, and I should say, when I evaluated the IMWs and your response sheet, you did not always have a question related to trying to identify the mechanism by which the fish would respond to the treatment. Okay, but when you look at the hypotheses under those, for example, in a Soton Creek, a Soton Creek, man, when they, when they sat down and thought about hypotheses, they went to town because they have over two dozen hypotheses that they're examining in a Soton Creek. Several of those deal with mechanisms. So although he did not or they did not identify specific questions related to it, they are addressing those within uh, their hypotheses. And several IMWs have design set up specifically to ask or answer um, mechanisms or to try and identify mechanisms. So you'll see, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit, little bit later, there's this uh, hierarchical framework that a lot of people are using. And you're using before, after control impact design at different spatial scales. They're nested. You have experiments nested within other experiments. And the idea of that is to try and tease out some causal mechanisms. So um, yes, I would say that they are um, asking the most appropriate and relative questions. Are they in watersheds with high potential for learning? OK, I would say yes, they are. Because if you look at all the number of limiting factors that are being addressed by the different IMWs, you can see they range from at least one to seven. And these were the limiting factors that you identified in your, in your sheets that were also summarized in the PNAP document. So each IMW, which is along the bottom, and the number of limiting factors that each is addressing are shown here. And these are the primary limiting factors, and several of you are even identifying limiting factors beyond this, but they're not the primary ones that you talked about. So all the limiting factors or threats are pretty much being addressed. Okay, the other cool thing about the IMWs is that they're not all done in the same size watershed. We have some IMWs that occur in a 12 kilometer watershed, and we have, God bless those people that are in the thousands of kilometers. Man, you'd be crazy. Um, if you think about that, that is, that is like a, that's a huge nightmare right there. I, I feel for you guys, man. That's, a, that's going gangbusters. So, yeah, so we have quite a range. We also have a number of focal species that are being addressed in there. Um, there are some that are doing, like George's group, man, they're going to town. They're doing everything. The only thing I didn't see in there were a couple sucker species that they're not doing. But they're hitting almost all the salmonids, even Pacific lamprey. And I don't even think I got the LWA or the LWA correct because I didn't include chum and paint. Um, nor did I do the smelt. I think you also had smelt, but. They have a bunch that, these are the priority uh, or the focal species that were identified. And you can see that there's a wide variety. Uh, each IMW is doing one or more. So that's pretty cool. So overall, yes, I believe the IMWs are in watersheds that will provide some very useful information. Okay, are, they in the, are all the IMWs still needed to answer the primary question and the reason, and if so, for what purposes and for what period of time? Um, yeah, what? Uh, so this is a compound question. And so we have a key question with some primary questions. And for purposes in time, and yeah, OK. So if I'm a manager or a policy person, I would be asking the simple question, are habitat actions making a difference in fish populations at the watershed scale? And if so, which actions work best? If that or those are the primary questions, then I would say, yep, we're right on. Now, if there's some other primary question that's being asked that I don't know about, then I can't answer that. But I do believe that when I evaluated the IMWs, I think, yes, they are answering the primary question. I mean, think about it. Why are you doing an IMW? You want to see if the treatments that you're implementing are having an effect at the watershed or population scale. 
That seems obvious. So everyone we heard today is trying to do that. Okay? There are several IMWs that have already demonstrated it. And I think Greg said there were 10. He identified 10. I actually didn't count them up. I've written them out, but I didn't actually count them. But there are several that have demonstrated that, yes, these treatments, if you implement the right treatment in the right place at the right time, you get a response, and that response actually translates into things that are good at the population or the watershed scale. That's really good. Okay, let's try the second part of this question. How much time is needed to answer these? Well, the simple answer is it really depends on the IMW. And I think it's super unfair to say everybody should have the same time length. What is this time length related to? There are several factors that will affect the amount of time that it takes to get a treatment effect at the population scale or a response at the population scale. The first is the size of the, po of the watershed. Man, those dudes that are working in those big watersheds, you're going to have to kick that system hard to get a response at the population scale. And it's going to take a long time because there isn't the money, the resources, or the logistics to get your actions implemented within a short time. And we heard from the folks working in the Middle Fork and, and uh, Potlatch and other places that are saying, look, it, it's going to take us years to get our actions in there. It's not going to be something we can just put in in a short period of time and then measure a response. So the bigger the watershed, the more difficult it is going to be to answer these questions in a short period of time. Okay, the size and the complexity of the treatment. Okay, if you're, if you're only able to treat a small percentage of the degraded habitat within a year, it's going to take you a long time to get it done. And that's related to the size of the watershed. Think about it. In, I think it was 10 Mile, they did like 30%, over 30% of the area, but the watershed is small. You know how big 30% of the Lemhi is? That's huge. It's going to take a while to do. Okay, the experimental design. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this a little bit later, but the success of answering the questions and the time it's going to take depends on the type of design you use. And in some cases, you may have a lot of pretreatment data. The Keogh River, hundreds, over a hundred publications have come out of the Keogh River, but they started their sampling on fish back in 1976. Okay, they have a long data series. So when you have 15 years of pretreatment data, and you implement an action, it doesn't take very long to uh, tease out a treatment effect. We don't have that benefit in most cases. Okay, the precision of our measurement. We've all heard about how naturally variable our populations are in all these watersheds, and there's a lot of things that affect that. And it's not just in the populations, it's in the habitat too. We've heard about that. So the precision of our measurements affect how long it's gonna take. Escapement level, this is your seeding. Okay, I'm going to ta tell you a little bit about Fish Creek a little bit later, but um, some people thought that was a bust of a, of a uh, IMW simply because Chinook salmon <laughs> didn't even go back in there and spawn. So there were no juveniles in there to actually measure. Escapements can be a, a, a bummer, and I think we heard a little bit about that in Ten Mile also. It may have also happened a little bit in Minnesota and other places. Natural and anthropogenic disturbances. Okay, we've heard a little bit about that. The issue about fires in the Antiat, well, it was huge. This last year, there was a huge fire in the Antiat. Um, fires, droughts, um, landslides, all these things can affect the success of our IMWs. They can actually reset them. Okay, and you're back to where you were when you started maybe five, six years ago. So that's a problem. One that we don't often think about are the anthropogenic disturbances. And these are things like changes in management. Changes in like hatchery practices, uh, Greer talked about that occurring in the Antiat. We had a spring Chinook hatchery in there that was dumping out lots of fish and lots of fish returning, and then they shut it off and turned it into a summer Chinook uh, hatchery. Okay, what effect does that have on your design? What if they change the harvest regulation so you no longer have as many fish going in to seed the habitat? Another one is that, that you may have a situation where you can open up miles or kilometers of habitat, spawning and rearing habitat, because there's an artificial field that's blocking or uh, a barrier there, and you're proposing to put in an action that would get fish upstream, but it happens to be an important fishery right below there, a recreational and tribal fishery. And, you know, you're competing with other management activities. So 
yeah, there's great potential for increasing the distribution and carrying capacity for the stock, but you're also perhaps affecting another management action. And so you have to deal with those things. And those are some of the things that I think Greer was talking about. Um, coordination and funding, and we always hear about this. The bigger the watershed, I think, the more difficult it is to coordinate the implementation of actions and the monitoring. And Greer hit on that. And we're always going to deal with funding constraints. I mean, that's just the world we live in. And the bummer about that is that if you're in a smaller watershed, you may be able to get things implemented a little easier through, you know, you don't have the coordination. But, you know, the funding may not take as much because your treatment doesn't have to be as big as it does in, say, the Middle Fork John Day or in the Lemhi. Okay, are there uh, IMWs that have reached their logical conclusion or for other reasons should be rammed down or ended? And I'm glad I'm up here because there's an exit door right here. So as I go through these, if you get too nasty, then we'll see what happens. But first of all, I think for sure this is not the right question you ask the scientists. I don't know of any scientist who would, would ever say, yeah, you need to you know, turn off your monitoring or turn off your research. That just doesn't happen unless, unless, Funding is limited. I have my IMWs, and my IMW is competing with your IMW for funding, then I'm going to say yours needs to be shut off because i got to keep mine going. But really, it's a tough question. And there are several IMWs that have been successful, right? And, and we know about those. Uh, Bridge Creek is a successful one. There are several that have been successful. Okay, they've demonstrated treatment effects at the watershed scale. So one could logically say, yeah, you know what, maybe that one could be turned off or reduced. I would argue that you do not want to turn them off. Just because it was successful does not tell us how the longevity of the success of that project. And I thought it was really cool when 10 Mile, because I read the original Johnson paper, and it was like done in eight to 10 years, and it's like, wow, they really showed a nice treatment effect, right? And the, the logical question is, well, is that treatment effect still there? Did it blow out? Did it not work? When, when did it, you know, there's a bunch of questions we can ask about it. We would never know the answer to that unless we continue doing some level of monitoring. And to that end, I would say, yes, don't turn it off. Let's just look at maybe reducing the frequency of the monitoring. Maybe go every three to five years and do your sampling. You know what's nice about 10 Mile is that they've done it annually. We can actually look at their data and say, would we see a treatment effect if they would have monitored every three years or every five years? Because they have 17 additional years of data. And we can play, we can game their data and see if they would still come up with the same result if they were doing it every three years instead of annually. And there's cost savings associated with that. So I would recommend that. Um, I would collect only the relative relevant fish and habitat data. And for habitat, you can use UAVs to get a lot of that type of information. For fish, you're gonna probably have to do, you know, you have to do your fish in, fish out stuff. So that wouldn't change. You may not have to do all your microhabitat work and all the growth and, uh, and survival studies, but known fish in, fish out, I think would be appropriate. But using UAVs, I mean, we have really cool technology now and we can use that stuff to help us see if the, the treatment effect is still there. Okay, the other IMWs, don't touch them. Keep them going, right? Because they're still in their infancy or in various stages of development, and uh, maybe they haven't shown a treatment effect, but they're still adding treatment. So to pull the plug on them right now, I don't think would be appropriate. I don't think it would be appropriate to reduce the amount of effort going into doing those. I think there's still a lot to be learned with those. So at this point, um, yeah, there are some that have reached their logical conclusion, but I wouldn't necessarily turn them all the way off. I think there's still stuff we can learn from those ongoing uh, um, projects. Are there additional INWs that should be brought online? This is a great question because if you think about it, what I've told you so far is that all the IMWs or the current IMWs address a wide range of limiting factors. We're getting those. It includes a wide array of complexity, of, or of treatment types and complexity. There's a, uh, they vary widely in their size and are distributed across the ecoregions of the Pacific, Pacific Northwest. So just based on that, you would say, yeah, maybe there is no need to add them. But if you look at the, the uh, focal species that are included in the IMWs, you kind of get a different picture. 
And what you'll see is that, yeah, people love to work with Steelhead and Co. I don't know why Steelhead is the most popular, because to me, they're the most complex uh, to deal with. They're linked out there with like Lamprey and Bulltrot when you're trying to deal with them, because they got several different life history styles. Co, Salmon, Chinook, and Cutthroat should, well, Cutthroat would be a pain, but Co and Chinook but should be simple. But the Chinook is the one that caught my eye. Now, three of the Chinook IMWs, one of them was Fish Creek, which failed because no Chinook actually came back. I mean, they were trying to treat for Chinook, but Chinook just didn't make it into uh, spawn in there, so they had no turn. So that got to down to five. The Antiatus, or as we just heard, has been basically shut down or reduced, and so that was a Chinook IMW. Now we're down to what, four? And then if you look at the Skagit, which is the biggest IMW, it's focusing on Chinook, but it's looking at life history characteristics that are affected by actions implemented in the estuary. Okay, so it's not really doing the whole watershed. It's just focusing on the estuary. So you're really left with like three that deal with Chinook. And to me, I think that is a gap. I think we could do more with that. And to that end, I would say, let's add some more Chinook. One, and this one I'm sure is going to raise some questions, especially now that Greer just talked about this. It's like she gave us every reason why it was a bust, and I'm saying, yeah, but let's resurrect it. And why would I do that? Well, it's because you don't have to go, first of all, there's going to be a huge treatment effect in there, okay, and Greer showed that. The biggest part of the treatment is yet to come, and that's going to happen over the next several years. We have baseline data. We have fish in, fish out data. At the, at the ENIAT scale. Okay, given that, and given a big treatment effect, we could resurrect this and not go to the same complex type of an IMW it was before, but we can rethink it and recouch it and, and develop an IMW that I think would tell us whether or not we're getting a benefit with Chinook. Okay, and uh, so that's why I proposed the ENIAT, because it's already there. And then the, the next one I proposed was a gift to Tom Cooney for his retirement. And I said, you know, Tom, I think we should do an IMW in the Grand Ron. And I picked the Grand Ron because the, there's a lot of work going on in the Grand Ron, okay? And they developed some models for the Grand Ron. And you're gonna hear tomorrow, and you've already heard today, the importance of life cycle modeling. Well, they have some uh, models in the Grand Ron. They even have fish habitat models that have been developed by Critvic and also the Forest Service, the Ranger State or the Research Station in Boise has developed some habitat models for it. We're set up nicely to do a Chinook salmon IMW in the Grand Ron somewhere. And so I would recommend that uh, people think about that as another option for doing uh, an IMW if you had that one. Now what do we do about bull trout, uh, coastal cutthroat, and Pacific lamprey? They, few IMWs were actually addressing those. Well, a lot of these species, at least for bull trout and Pacific lamprey, occur in most of the IMWs in the Columbia River Basin. And it would only, it would be simple, just add these to your IMW, right? Um, and that's my recommendation. <laughs> Actually do it. And, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to do some really creative thinking because bull trout and Pacific lamprey have some pretty, Pretty wild uh, life history characteristics. I mean, Pacific lamprey, the amethyst can stay in there for up to seven years before they actually transform into a transformer or macrothalmia and migrate out. The adults come back and they can hang out one, two, maybe three years in the stream before they actually spawn. There's a lot going on there, all right? And so we're just learning about Pacific lamprey. Uh, bull trout, they have several life history characteristics too. And so dealing with them would be kind of like dealing with steelhead. And so maybe adding them, if you think it's important, I think adding those may not be that big of a deal. Um, and I say all that, you know, knowing that funding is limited. Um, okay, so enough on that. Are there some, are any of the IMWs unlikely to meet their intended objectives within the implied tenure? Absolutely. In fact, most of them. I would say most of them are. Why? Because it's a dumb timeline. Okay, it's just t totally unrealistic. If you're thinking, IMWs, by their very nature, are long-term study. And to assume, unless it's a really small IMW, like in 14 square uh, kilometers, you might be able to pull it off in 10. We saw it in, um, in 10 Mile. They did it in a short period of time. The ALSI did it in a short period of time. There are several that, or a few that have. 
but the majority have it and they won't. And I think we need to understand that and be realistic about it. And so there are several factors that affect why the timeline is inappropriate. And I'm not saying, you know, you don't have check-ins in 10 years. I think that's probably good. But to assume that we can finish an IMW in 10 years is just wrong. And here's why. First of all, it takes us a while in a, in a watershed to figure out all the limiting factors, what threats are causing those factors to be limiting, and what life stage is limiting. We have found that life cycle models really work well for that. Okay, but it's not easy to develop a life cycle model. It takes time and money to do that. But this is the first step, and this takes time. Well, once you've done that, then you have to identify and uh, you, have to, you have to implement a prioritization plan. You have to develop a prioritization plan that identifies the appropriate action to address the limiting factor or threat, place it in the right area, and sequence it correctly. That's a lot of work. That's not something you just do in one, uh, in one or two months. That takes some time. The size and the magnitude of the treatment affects it. There's been published studies. Uh, uh, Phil Roney's peeps, him and his buddies, they published a paper what, back in George 2011 or something like that. Yeah, 2010, that looked at, look, you're going to have to at least treat 20% of the degraded habitat to get an effect. Well, if my watershed is 8,000 8, kilometers square, what is 20%? How big is that treatment? And how much time is it going to take to implement that? If I'm working in a smaller watershed, yeah. I may be able to do it in a year or two. So the, you know, the size and magnitude of your treatments is going to affect the timeline. Okay, oh, I just said it, it's the size of the watershed. It's related to that. Coordination, we've heard a lot about that. Greer gave us a laundry list of the issues related to coordination in the Antioch. You all identify, I think everybody identified coordination as an issue when you filled out your questionnaire. Coordination is difficult. And this is why I feel sorry for those people working in the big IMWs because they have a lot of coordination to do and it takes time to do that. Maintaining your control and or reference areas. Now this is important and I think sometimes we forget that a control is not a reference and a reference is not a control. And we use them interchangeably but they're not the same thing. A control is very similar to your treatment before you treat it. So it's like the bad habitat. If you find a control watershed, it's a watershed that has the same problems, same limiting factors that you have in your treatment. A, a reference watershed or a reference area is just the opposite. It's your target. It's like, here's what really good habitat is, here's my habitat, and I want to get my habitat looking like my reference. And so trying to maintain those over a long period of time can be difficult, regardless if it's a, if it's a control within, like in a, a staircase type design, or if it's an external control, maintaining those over the life of the IMW is difficult. And here's one of the reasons why that's difficult, and I think this may be happened in the ANIAT, and it's probably happened elsewhere. In the ANIAT, we have ESA listed species. We have three ESA listed species. One of them is in danger, the Chinook salmon. And you go in there and you develop a design that says, this area of this channel is going to be my treatment, this area is going to be my control, my treatment control, and no one is going to touch my control over the life or until the, the stage when it, it needs to be treated. I am going to tell people when the treatments go in and where they go in. The problem is, is that there are project sponsors out there looking for opportunities to go, do good things, what we call random acts of kindness, do really nice things for fish in these uh, watersheds. If there's a landowner that's in the control area that says, yes, you can go in and breach my dike and open up these off channel, it's super hard to stop that from happening. And if you try it, it's like, whoa, you're, you're impeding uh, ESA delisting, you know, and we'll never get to delisting because your stupid uh, monitoring design is preventing us from getting there. We have to deal with things like that. And it can be just the opposite. You know, you may have a nice reference area that all of a sudden gets hosed because for whatever reason the landowner decided he was going to clear the riparian zone or something. And so we have to, we're, we're always dealing with that and it could be natural disturbances that affect our controls and references. And that isn't good because that was the wrong button. Okay, um, I, th I thought that was there for a moment, but I was supposed to be done, um, which you're all wishing I were. 
Um, okay, the uh, next one is dealing with natural and anthropogenic disturbances. We talked about that already, um, your floods, your uh, landslides, things like that. Variable spawning escapement. These are difficult to deal with, especially if you have two different watersheds. One's a treatment, and the other one's a control or a reference. Okay, if they're not getting the same amount of spawning escapement, we have to somehow model for that. And that takes time, and that takes uh, uh, money. And so that can really affect our um, ability to um, implement or get it in on a 10-year timeline. And then finally, there's limited funding. This is going to be true no matter what. We're all competing for limited dollars and trying to implement uh, IMWs is a very expensive thing. And so it would be great from the funder's point of view if you could get it done in 10 years, but the reality is it's probably not gonna happen. Okay, so what are we learning from all these IMWs? This is your last question, and it'll take me a little bit to get through this because we've learned a lot. And I'd like to start off because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm by Aver, man. I've been around a long time, apparently. So I'm going to go back to some of the earlier IMWs. And the one I really like is the Fish Creek IMW. It was really not even identified, I think, in PNAP as an IMW, but it truly was. And I'm not going to actually throw this out there because Gordy Reeves was one of the uh, researchers on it, and he was one of my advisors, one of my many advisors in grad school. But uh, we've learned a lot from the Fish Creek IMW, and several people would say it was a huge failure because it wasn't able to document uh, population effects at the watershed scale. I would say we learned more from that than we have most other IMWs, and we learned what not to do in many cases. Um, so here's what we've learned from the Fish Creek. The first one is enhancement projects need to address watershed scale processes including upland processes, and avoid the band-aid approaches to stream restoration. We all know that. We've learned that. We learned that from this IMW. And by the way, this was back before Y2K, so um, it was a while ago. Uh, next, from the Fish Creek, we learned that both spatial and temporal controls are needed to increase certainty and treatment effect. It's not always possible to have these, uh, you usually get one or the other, but it's best to try and have both. They also taught us that large-scale natural disturbances can quickly erase treatment and their effects. And if you've studied the papers that come out of the Fish Creek IMW, you know they had a big problem with that. Um, there was a huge storm that wiped out most of their, I think, a lot of their structures. I don't remember the percentage of them, but most of them were blown completely out of the watershed. Okay, you need to focus on biological significance rather than statistical significance. We learned that. I actually heard that this morning. Somebody was talking about that. You know, sometimes it's easy to show statistical significance if you got enough power, but it may be the addition of 200 fish. Does 200 fish get us anything? What if it's 2,000 fish? What if that's what our, our biological goal should be? That's what we should focus on less on statistical significance and more on the biological significance. And then the last thing that they taught us, um, no, the, the second to the last, is that you've got to have adequate spawning escapements. If you don't, then your, your IMW isn't going to work. Like I said, they were hoping to improve habitat and uh, freshwater productivity for spring Chinook. They were also using coho and steelhead. Uh, but Chinook was one of their focal species, and in their reports, they talk about they had no Chinook actually go in and spawn in their stream, so they had no way of evaluating the success of their treatments on Chinook, which was kind of a bummer. And then lastly, we need to avoid major changes in sampling methods during the life of the study. These are long-term studies, and we usually start off with studies that are methods that are kind of prehistoric. Um, some of these that uh, were going back in the, in the late 1990s, they were using, remember the Hankin and Reeves method? They were being used a lot. You hardly hear anybody using Hankin and Reeves now. You got bathymetric, you got total state, you got all this really cool high level stuff that measures things right down to fine scale, which is really great. But if you started off in your IMW using stick and tape or a Hankin and Reeves type method, and then you convert over, you better make sure you have a crosswalk model that will allow you to use those earlier data. Because otherwise, you've just interrupted your time series, and the, the change in whatever you're measuring 
you have to determine whether that was from your treatment or from your change in methodology. Okay, so those are things to keep in mind. So those are the important lessons we learned from a failed IMW. And I was glad to see when I reviewed your responses that almost everybody, I think everybody, either knew about these or aware, were aware of these because the newer IMWs are not going down the same path that this one did. So what are we learning from the more recent ones? Okay, first of all, what I see is successful IMWs identify and treat the primary factors limiting fish within the watershed. And you go, wow, big deal, duh. Everyone does that. It's like, uh, not everyone. It wasn't always done. Sometimes we just thought we knew the limiting factor and we'd go out and do something and we didn't get a response. Okay, I'm not going to pick on anyone here, but it was the lower Columbia, I think, did some nutrient enhancement. Okay, and they got, they got some, I think they had treatment effects from the spring nutrient enhancement work, but it did not translate into watershed scale effects. Okay, as best I could tell, no one had identified nutrients as being limited in that watershed, in those watersheds. So if it was never identified as a limiting factor, but you implemented the action, and you did not see a treatment effect, that implies that maybe it wasn't a limiting factor. A lot of work goes into identifying limiting factors. Okay, it's a difficult thing to do. It takes time and money to do that. But if you're going to be successful with your IMW, addressing the primary limiting factors is the first thing you need to do. Okay, then next, treatments need to be large, and I talked about this earlier. I mean, the work that uh, Phil Roney and his group did, they showed that you need to kick it harder than 20%. Okay, to get a treatment effect, and that was based on statistics, I think, getting a, some probability of, a, of detecting a, a, a treatment effect. And so this is really critical. If you're in a big IMW, like the Lemhi Potlatch or someplace like that, we know it's going to take a while to get enough treatments in there to show a treatment effect. Unless you're lucky enough and you're Dr. Pass and you get to work in the, you know, the LWA where the big treatment effect is moving two big dams and watching a big flood of sediment go down and then all the fish recolonize it and you nailed it. That's a big treatment effect, you know, and it's, it's a thing you can do in a short period of time. You're not adding wood here and there and trying to get there on a short time scale. Um, next one, smaller watersheds respond more quickly to treatments than do larger watersheds. There's another bell. I'm not even going to talk about that because that's so simple. Um, IMWs require robust, flexible experimental designs. The best I can tell, it, it looks like the Baki design is the best, and it's because you have both spatial and temporal control, and so you're dealing with most of the threats to uh, validity, to the validity of your design. And if you don't know what all that means, it's in the report. Uh, I put it in there for you. But really, it's almost impossible. I would think it's almost impossible to do a Baki type design at a watershed scale the size of like the Lemhi. Where are you going to find a control watershed the size of the Lemhi? Maybe the Pissimeroi or something like that. But people are in there playing in the Pissimeroi. So how are you going to maintain the Pissimeroi over time as a control? The bigger your, your watershed, the more difficult it's going to be to find a uh, temporal control. And so you're stuck with a before, after, or maybe a paired, a post-treatment paired type design. And those are still valid, but you still have to deal with the issues that are threats to your conclusion. You have to be able to argue that the treatment effect you identified, not having a, a temporal control, was directly related to the treatment and not something that happened by history or what is called by chance during history alone. So you have to deal with those kind of threats to it. And so making the, the design somewhat flexible, I think, is important. And as, I, as Greer pointed out in the ENIAT, it was a pretty rigid design, and it, it just kind of floundered because there wasn't a lot of flexibility built into it. Next, nested hierarchical designs allow evaluation and treatment effects at multiple scales. I love these, not because they're complex and difficult to implement, but they give us, they give us a lot of useful information at small scale that we can use to help us tease out treatment effects. Right? We can identify mechanisms with these kind of designs. I really like these. And although they're difficult, having experiments nested under larger scale experiments is a good way to go. And I think uh, it tells us quite a bit. Um, next, IMWs benefit from long-term fish and habitat data series. I already told you about the Keel River. 
Man, those guys are so lucky they have data going back to 1975. I think a lot of people in the questionnaire also identified that, you know, our IMW is in an area, we picked it because in this area because we actually had a long data series. We had some either small data or we had adult data and it seemed like a logical place to put an IMW and that makes sense. That's one of the reasons why I recommended both the ANIET and the Grand Rod. Okay, oh, and just as a side note on that, I don't know if many of you know that, I don't know how many remands the FCRPS biops have gone through, but it was one way back in the day, Chris Jordan and I, and Michael Newsom, hey, there's a name from the past, I don't know if you all remember him, and Kim, uh, 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 Dr. Kratz, I forgot his first name, sorry, um, but there was a team of us that were asked to identify IMWs to put in the Columbia River Basin to help, I, to help address um, uh, one of the uh, uh, RFP or the uh, RPAs in the BIA. And I think this was back in like 2004, 2000, I don't remember, so long ago. That was a lot of beatings ago. And anyhow, we actually set up, and because we knew we wouldn't be doing them ourselves, we said, hey, the limb high, because there's data in there and it's big and we'd like to do that. I think we came up with the John Day, we came up with, um, the, we had the Methow, the Aniat. We even had the Wenatchee in there. We had several that we had identified, and some of those actually stuck, and that's why those were selected. We did those because we went out and looked at the ecoregion, and we wanted to make sure we had an IMW in all the major ecoregions, so we can and address a bunch of different limiting factors, and we weren't picking them in wilderness areas because, you know, those don't have a lot of potential to teach us much. So um, we were careful about selecting certain IMWs in certain areas. Other places, I think it's mostly been opportunistic. You know, it's just, it was a, we had a lot of data and this seems like a good place to do it. We have limiting factors we've identified and, and we have some potential funding to get the uh, actions on the ground. So um, I think it's important uh, to understand that it's not always just, it, it just seemed like a logical place to do it. A lot of thought went into identifying some of these IMWs. And we've already talked about, you know, changes in controls and references. Um, we've learned a lot about that, spawning the statements, many, many actions, all those can confound our IMWs and we have to be able to deal with those. Um, our IMWs require extensive coordination and long-term funding, we've talked about that. And our IMWs benefit from the use of life cycle models and adaptive management plans. And, uh, you know, Steve and his group actually published a paper, I think it was in Fisheries, that talked a lot about adaptive management. And what we've heard today, actually, you may not even know, but you are using adaptive management because you take your monitoring results after you've implemented an action and you said, oh, my word, that didn't work out, so I'm going to change it. I'm going to do something kind of different. You're actually doing a form of adaptive management. What Steve and his, his folks did is that they lined it up. They gave you this excellent, it's a great read, so I, w I would recommend you read it and you apply it because... What we're finding is that IMWs that are working under an, an adaptive management framework are more likely to succeed because you're actually using the information to inform your action, your uh, treatment. So I would do that. Life cycle modeling, a few of them, and you know, God bless them because they've had the resources to develop the models. Not every IMW has a life cycle model, but those that do are using it and it's informing their restoration work and their IMW. I know Potlatch has been using it, and they're, they're using it, because, and we heard it this morning, because it's telling them how much effort it's going to take to do the treatments, to put in the right treatments in the right place. Um, I think the Asotin, the John Day, several of them are doing it. We learned a lot from the John Day in the sense that they did a lot of treatments, but they had very little effect at the population scale. And in fact, their model told them, unless you do something with temperature, you can do all those little acts of kindness out there and you're not gonna get a population response. And so these models are very important. They, they should be used to help, uh, and they can be used in the adaptive management framework. So I think that's important. And then finally, I think it's important to understand that, yeah, we don't always get the return of adults, okay? Really, that's not the primary question here, but there's a lot of people out there, there, out there that, uh, that are saying, well, look, you're doing all this restoration work. Are we getting more adults returning? Yeah, that's hard to tell. At this point, I cannot say whether, like, the successful 
IMW and Bridge Creek is bringing back more adults. There are too many things that are affecting what happened to the fish once they leave the basin. And so to try and say that a successful IMW has to bring back more adults, I think is not the right, that's not the right thing to say. I would not recommend that we go down that road. If we're increasing small production, or we're increasing the productivity of the population at the watershed or population scale, that's the best we can do. And if we've done that, I think we've been highly successful in our IMW. And to expect that we're going to get a bunch of adults back is maybe asking too much from our IMW. And I refer to the Keogh River. They were very successful in, in increasing uh, juvenile productivity and, um, and small survival, growth, and production from their habitat work, which included in-stream structures and nutrient enhancement. But they got no return, an increase in returns from their adults. And they said it was because of ocean conditions and the harvest in the ocean affected it. And now they're transitioning. They're looking at doing some really cool uh, stream flow uh, actions. And they can regulate stream flows in the Keogh, which is going to really be a nice IMW because they, they are saying now that stream flow, summer stream flow, is probably the limiting factor at this point. And they can regulate the flows that go down there. So they've got a really nice design set up to actually tease out the effect of stream flows on production. But they're also cautious to say we may be able to increase juvenile productivity and abundance, but we cannot guarantee we're going to get more adults back because there are too many things that affect the return of adults. And so don't get into an argument with man or, uh, managers or policy people or just local people like Greer was saying, that you're not bringing back any more adults. This is a total bust. And it's like, yeah, but I've increased my small production 200%. This is no longer an issue about beating on habitat. You go and talk to the other folks downriver because this isn't a habitat issue now. So um, those are it. Those, uh, I'll end it there. I'm probably running out of, I ran out of time a long time ago, didn't I? And, uh, but the beauty of being the last, see, what, what is fun about this is I get to tell you what you told me, just in case you forgot what you told me. So, I just get to summarize everything. So, are there any questions for me on this? Or is it?